Hello, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. I'm Gregory Shillette. Thank you, Center, for inviting me. Will, I'm looking forward to the conversation afterwards. Uh, what I want to do is actually present a body of work that was created before Photoshop was even available. I mean, it just sort of started and I really didn't have a copy of it. So all the work you see will have been created either in the camera or often using miniatures that I photograph. And the works themselves I think of as a kind of meta photography because I'm looking at the work of people like Steichen, uh, Jacob Rees, Lewis Hine, and I'm making critical commentary on it through another kind of level of photography. All of this is really connected to a larger body of concerns in my work, uh, my collective work with the group Repo History, which I will talk about a little bit, also my research and writing, uh, which has to do with the question of how we see the past and how the past uh, imposes itself or even disturbs the present. What is the nature of historical representation and what role does lens-based imaging play in that? What you're looking at is actually something I produced based on the famous uh, book by Jacob Rees, which collected images from the late 19th century he had taken, primarily in poor and working class parts of New York City. And uh, this is a re-photograph of his book cover with an image on the side that has a slightly mysterious quality. Uh, the image is actually a small figurine that I constructed or I built out of clay and photographed. In fact, all of these initial images I'm going to show you have to do with reimagining a particular Jacob Rees photograph using miniatures for the most part, re-photographing them and printing them as Cibachrome prints. And this is how one in a series of nine different projects looks. You could think of these as uh, almost like early cinema where you get different frames and you have a kind of photo montage effect, the juxtaposition of images being very important. And they were framed in this way, wooden frames. This is about a meter left to right. Coming back to Rees, he's well known, of course, for the series How the Other Half Lives, but also for actually instigating changes in the way tenement buildings are constructed because he showed how awful the living conditions were in around 1900 in New York City. Some of my work though really is built on my friend, the theorist Martha Rosler's work, and Martha's also a photographer, I should say. Uh, she makes the point that documentary as we know it carries old information about a group of powerless people to another group addressed as socially powerful. And her important critique in, around, and after thoughts on documentary photography really lays out a sort of deep questioning of people like Jacob Rees, who, however well-intentioned and however important they, they were in terms of reforms, nevertheless played a kind of voyeuristic role in the way he treated his uh, subjects, really kind of turning them into almost kind of an ob object uh, for the camera. This is a quote from, from Rees, uh, selected from Rosser's book, we used to go in the small hours of the morning to the worst tenements. The sights I saw there gripped my heart until I felt that I must tell of them or burst or turn into an anarchist or something. What you notice though in these photographs is the fact that these people were sitting in dark rooms. And here's another quote from Reese that relates to that point. There it was, the thing I had been looking for all those years, a four line dispatch from somewhere in Germany if I remember right, had it all, a way had been discovered to, uh, it ran, to take pictures by flashlight. The darkest corner might be photographed that way. And it's clear that in a certain level, Reese was literally intruding on these people's lives, flashing this powder in their face as they were sitting in a darkened space. And here's just some of the... Uh, advertising for the type of flash medium that might have been available around that time. This might be just a little bit later. And we're talking the 1890s. The, the image of the street urchin, uh, the sort of homeless child or the, tr or the very, very in poor in, uh, child who lives most of the time in the street, I, you see it here as a, as a sort of wood engraving by Dorothy Tennant from London. Sometimes they were called street Arabs. And Reese picks up on this theme 
uh, in a lot of his photographs. It interested me very much at the time. I had been, I was really a, a new dad at the time as well, and I was thinking a lot about the way children were represented in uh, history and in, in, in photography and in art. Uh, and here you can see he clearly posed these children to really resemble in some ways the kind of woodcuts that were already well known. Another Reese image. The barrel is a curious addition of prop. Uh, it's almost certain these kids looked like they were really trying hard to look like they were sleeping when they really weren't. But this is the image that struck me the most, perhaps because of the strange space that it takes takes around it, uh, the odd shadow to the left that almost looks like a, a face perhaps moving across the wooden panels behind, and the way they're playing in and around the barrel. The question I asked myself was, what if these kids turned around to Reese and said, why are you taking my picture? What are you doing there? You know, confronting the, the, the photographer with the power of the lens, with their own bodies and their own presence. And so without using Photoshop, again, I created a miniature set and began photographing it. And that's what turned into this series. Sometimes interposing the original photograph from the Reese book. Here the shadow becomes truly ominous with the kid who's kind of leaning into the barrel. And again, we're not sure if this is being voyeuristic or someone's confronting us. Is Reese perhaps backing up, afraid? Maybe. And just to give a sense of the model reconstructed as a little tableau. So that's mid-1990s, a little bit after that, not much after that. I was involved in a collective called Repo History. I helped co-found the group, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. But one of the things that I was interested in was uh, J.P. Morgan, who, as you may know, was an orphan raised by very wealthy people. And this is a portrait, a well-known portrait of Morgan by Steichen that Morgan really hated because the armchair that he was sitting in with its reflective surface looks like he's got a dagger and he's pointing it at the photographer. Ultimately, this is the project that I created as part of Repo History's work. And Repo History was a group of artists and activists and educators, and we put street signs up in Lower Manhattan and also other cities uh, where we talked about the specific site and histories that people really didn't know much about at that site or had been forgotten or in some ways uh, completely repressed. So Exchange Place, which is down near Wall Street, is the location of this sign, which takes as its source J.P. Morgan. But what's the story? As it turns out, Morgan as a young man, clearly not in this picture where he's photographed by Steichen as an old man, but as a young man, he would have been uh, available to be drafted into the Civil War. However, Lincoln made it possible for wealthy people to buy out of, uh, of service. And uh, Morgan was one of those people who got a reprieve from having to be a soldier, uh, along with Rockefeller and other young men uh, of, of fighting age. And the, the peculiar thing, though, is that while Morgan had a second, because the money that was paid actually paid for another soldier to be in service, well, he had a second battling it out against the South, the Confederacy, Morgan and other wealthy individuals were speculating against the North in a place called the Gold Room in Lower Manhattan, right near where the sign is located. It was an old coal chute where men would go. They would wait for dispatches from the front. And if the South was winning, they would become jubilant because the price of gold would go up and their wealth would go up. And if the price, if, if the South lost, they would stand on tables and sing John Brown's body. Uh, because they had clearly lost a lot of money. So I thought this was incredibly ironic and worth pointing out to the public, and that's how the project, and here you see, these are clay reconstructions of the Morgan photograph and then who his second might have been. And the, the, the uh, sign basically asks, who might he have been? A young Irishman, a young German? We'll never know. Just add the last note to the story, Morgan's uh, second did survive the war, and he paid that individual money uh, 
for a very long time or maybe the rest of his life. Uh, we don't know if he was injured. No one knows who the man was. Just to give you a little bit sense of repo history, repo history was a project, as I said, that put signs up in the street and it takes its name from Repo Man, the movie, which I recommend watching. And we put signs up about people who had died homeless in the streets. We talked about an unregulated free market economy. This is directly outside of the stock exchange. They didn't like that very much, but we had a permit to put it up for one year. And even though they tried to take it down, we kept it up. The first firefighter who was a woman, Brenda Berkman, created, a, uh, Susan Shoopley created the sign about her. Testimony and Mark O'Brien made a sign about the slave and meal market on lower Manhattan. It was on Wall Street, by the way. Uh, the death of many young people of color by police who were never litigated, Jenny Pollock, David Thorne. From 1994 to 96, 75 people were killed, shot in back, shot in the head, pinned face down, and shot, choked, hogtied, and crushed, beaten to death by New York City police officers. Only one was ever charged and didn't receive any kind of litigation uh, in, in this entire time. Now, this is 19... Uh, 98, by the way. Alan Michelson talking about the, the exploitation of uh, Native people by Jacob uh, Astor. Alan is a very interesting Mohawk artist. And Tom Clan and James Malone, who did a piece about the African Americans who were displaced in Georgia, uh, in Atlanta, to make way for the New South, so called urban renewal. And this is a picture of Malone's mother that he carried around at all times, turned into a sign. Or Jane Pagnuco, whose grandmother never made it off Ellis Island. People don't realize people went there and were sometimes considered unfit, and she was buried in a potter's field, uh, just as so many people today are being buried here in a potter's field because of the COVID. Uh, this, sign, this project went up in 1992. It was a, meant to counter the Columbus quincentennial because people were celebrating Columbus and we were criticizing Columbus. This sign, particular one by Pagnuco, was right near Ellis Island. So people taking the ferry would see this sign. And on the back of the signs was an explanation of these histories that I'm telling you. And here is, uh, again, James, James uh, Costanzo's sign, Advantages of an Unregulated Free Market Economy. It turned out that the stock exchange was actually having its anniversary, and they were very upset about this sign and asked it to be taken down. And again, it didn't happen because we had a permit. And I'm just about out of time. Uh, I did want to say that all of the repo history signs were marked on this map, which people could get free at the time and walk around and do their own tour of all of these 60 some locations. And I'll just end on one other project I did about uh, photography at the Tenement Museum here in New York City, which sadly just closed because of COVID, it seems. But these are figures, cut out figures of photographs of small clay figurines I created based on photographs by Jacob Rees and by Lewis Hine. You see here a young girl in a sweatshop in New England. And I created them in miniature, painted them, photographed them, and then enlarged them so they would be part of the, the sort of front, the facade of the um, museum, and was happy to see that the New York Times uh, covered this, extending the range of the critique. Thank you very much. I look forward to our conversation.